read this morning from the book of Joshua and chapter 1. Joshua and chapter 1. Let's hear the word of God. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory." No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and be of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is given you to possess. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. But you shall pass before your brethren armed, all your mighty men of valor, And help them until the Lord has given your brethren rest as he gave you, and they also have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side of the Jordan toward the sunrise. So they answered Joshua, saying, All that you command us we will do, and wherever you send us we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you, as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. I want us this morning to look at this first chapter of the book of Joshua. We first meet Joshua in the scriptures as the great general of Israel's army as he leads them against the Amalekites on that occasion when Moses was uh, with hands lifted high praying for them uh, from the mountaintop holding up the rod of God and as he lifted up his hands in prayer so Joshua prevailed in battle below and no doubt the Apostle Paul is referring to that Uh, great incident when he says, I will therefore that men everywhere pray lifting up holy hands. That's the first introduction that we have of Joshua in the Bible. And then we meet Joshua again when he and Moses came down from Mount Sinai and they hear strange noises in the camp and Joshua says to Moses, there's a sound of war in the camp and Moses says it's got nothing to do with war. And when they come down, they see the golden calf and the people dancing uh, around the calf. And Joshua sees Moses' reaction on that occasion when he broke the tablets of stone written upon with the finger of God, which he had brought down from Mount Sinai. 
There was rebellion amongst God's people, and there was the horror, the heinousness of sin. There were the people turning from the living God to serve idols. And then another time we meet Joshua is when he is sent as one of the twelve spies on the first reconnaissance mission into the promised land, and ten of them, you remember, return with that completely demoralizing testimony, don't even try to enter the land. It's far too dangerous. There are giants living there. And then Joshua and Caleb come and they speak of the greatness of God and they remember God's covenant promise to the people and they say, let's go up to the land and possess it because we're well able to overcome the land. And the people follow the ten. And they weep all night and Joshua at that uh, decision of the people, tears his clothes and he remonstrates with the people. It's a tremendous, a wonderful land and God has promised to give the land to us. Just don't rebel against the Lord. Don't fear those people. But the people refused to listen. They wanted to kill Joshua and Caleb. They believed the ten spies who said it just wasn't possible. And they despised the two who said, let's go up. That's a great warning to us. A warning to us about the weakness of majority religion. Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean it's the right thing at all. Fourteen months earlier, these people were slaves in Egypt, and now here they are in rebellion against God and disobeying him. After all he had done for them, after everything that they had seen, And so for the next 38 years, they wandered in circles in the wilderness until that whole generation, except uh, Joshua and Caleb, uh, had perished and passed away. And then we meet Joshua again, just a few chapters back in the previous book in Deuteronomy. In chapter 31, you find Joshua being summoned in verse 7. Then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give to them, and you will cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. And then later on, uh, very movingly in this chapter, they are both summoned to the tabernacle and in verse 14 we read then the lord said to to moses behold the day approach the days approach when you must die call joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of meeting that i may inaugurate him so moses and joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of meeting now the lord appeared at the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud and the pillar of cloud stood above the door of the tabernacle once before as a younger man Joshua had gone into the tabernacle with Moses and the cloud of God's glory had descended upon the tabernacle and now Moses is fast approaching the end of his life and he's stepping down from leadership and Joshua is to lead the people in the land and again the Lord gives them this tangible token of his presence. After the life of Moses is over and he's laid aside God is going to be with them still and his power and his presence will go before them and the work of the Lord is going to go on after the death of Moses. We often hear, don't we, uh, it said, no man is indispensable. And of course, in, in one sense, that is so. But in another sense, that isn't exactly right, is it? If you turn over again uh, two or three pages to the last chapter of Deuteronomy, chapter 34 and verse 10, we read this. But since then, there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. There never appeared to Israel again a, a man, a leader of the stature of Moses. He was unique. So what we actually have to say is, no man is indispensable, but every man is unique. Every Christian, every one of you in your particular service of God is unique. Men are dispensable, but you can't fill the gap left by one man as you can fill perhaps a gap left by a concrete block taken out of a wall. 
Concrete blocks are all made to be identical. One can entirely replace another. But in the final analysis, nobody can take the place of somebody else. That's the wonder of personality and of God using personality. God using men, individuals, in leadership in the church. Now, God is going to use Joshua. He is the unchallenged leader, and his hour has come, and Joshua is ready because of all the forces that God has used to influence and mold and shape and prepare him for this time. And Joshua has been taught many lessons, hasn't he? He's been taught that the true source of power is the living God. He's been taught how terrible sin is, especially when it's found amongst the people of God. He's been taught how God prepares a man. He's been taught to stand alone and to trust God, even if he's in the minority, even if everybody else says he's wrong and a fool and the whole enterprise is ridiculous and people are threatening to kill him, Joshua has been taught to stand and to trust the Lord. And so that's the background of this great day then uh, when God commissions Joshua to move into the land and to take possession of it. The days of mourning at the death of great Moses are over. The days of wandering in the wilderness are over. And now the people have to advance. Now they must enter and possess the land. So I want us, firstly, then to look at the commissioning of Joshua in verses 2 to 5. The people are going to enter and possess the land. And the only way that they're going to be able to do that is God must give it to them. That's the only way. Superior weaponry, superior manpower, superior firepower in battle is not going to do it. Brilliant strategy and generalship is not going to achieve it. The only way is that God must bring them in. God must do it. And so he says to Joshua, I am about to give you the land. I will give you every place where you stand. No one will be able to stand against you. God is going to do it. He's going to bring them into the land. I can illustrate that like this. If I wanted to go and wander around Buckingham Palace and look at all the rooms in the palace, well, there's no way that I could do that by myself. That could only happen if I received a a royal invitation from Her Majesty the Queen to come and to wander around her home. One of Elizabeth's late uncles was an official in the civil service. And about 30, 35 years ago, we went up to visit him in London. And there was a big security problem in London at that time. The Irish Republican Army was letting off uh, bombs in the city, and so there was very tight security. But Geraint could take us to Parliament and just nod at the security man on the door, and he would wave us through. And we went all around the Houses of Parliament with him. We would just wave through because we were with Geraint. Now, Geraint would regularly visit Buckingham Palace with papers. He could go there himself But he didn't have the right or the authority or the power to take us with him. We couldn't go there. Only the monarch has the authority to invite people into her home. That's the situation that we've got here now on the border of the promised land. They're on the border. They're looking into the land. They want to leave the wilderness and to have this inheritance. But for that to happen, God has to bring them in. They can't have this land any other way. God must give it to them. And that's a picture, you see, of higher realities. The only way anyone enters the kingdom of God to come into the sphere of the protection of God's grace and power is for God to bring them into his kingdom. God must do that by a new birth. He must do that by an adoption As many as received the Lord Jesus Christ to them, and to them alone does he give the right to be called the children of God. Only they are God's children. We're not all God's children by virtue of being alive in the world. As many as believe on his name who are born from above. Only they have 
this right and privilege. God brings us into the kingdom, into the sphere of his protection and influence. By his call, he calls us. By his power, he invites us. He makes offers to us, the terms of which we must obey and comply with. People can only come into the kingdom of God by the call and the command of Almighty God. I said I would give this land to Abraham's seed. I swore to their forefathers I would give it. So be prepared. This is the time to cross the river. I'm keeping my word. It's time to act. It's time to move, to go on, to obey. And so this tremendous commission is given to Joshua. He has to go and possess the land. Verse 4, from the wilderness of this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. That's the promise that he's given. It's repeated then in verse 9, the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's what Joshua is told on this great occasion. Remember, Hezekiah, in a situation of great distress, uh, says, With them is the arm of flesh, but with us is the living God to help us and to fight our battles. So Joshua has this great commission. Cross the Jordan, possess the territory, drive out the people, fight the battles. And so after all the years of wandering in the wilderness, Joshua is presented with this enormous undertaking and no doubt there were little groups of people saying to Joshua are are you sure this is the right time there are still so many difficulties and we need to be more united than we are we we need to have more of a power base amongst ourselves before we can take this on so there would have been some saying not yet Joshua we're not ready for this yet and then God comes to him and says now don't be discouraged don't be terrified But the Bible never just says to us, don't be terrified, don't be discouraged. The Bible says, don't be terrified, don't be discouraged, because. In other words, there is a reason for a Christian, for a believer, to have courage. There is a logic. What is the logic? What is the reason? It is this. I was with Moses. I will be with you wherever you go. And that's the great message of Pentecost, isn't it? It's not so much that the people spoke in tongues, but there was, with the witnessing church, the presence of God the Holy Spirit. That's the great thing. Wherever you go, the living God. Wherever you are, the Lord of hosts, the presence of God in and with his church. That's the great promise here. Don't be dismayed. Don't be afraid. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And that's Joshua's comfort. You are fighting God's battles. You're establishing God's kingdom. And so are we. Good soldiers of Jesus Christ. We are his heralds. It's God's battle. And if it's God's battle that we engage in, God meets the cost of it. And if it's God's battle, victory is secure. It's not that Joshua, you see, had forces equal to those that were arrayed against him, because he didn't. It's not that he's got better morale and better discipline and better organization like Cromwell's roundheads, and because of that they can overcome the king's cavaliers. No, it's not because of that. It is God is with him, and that gives him and us the preeminence. And surely that ought to work wonders for the morale of the church. As I was with Moses, delivering the people from Egypt, rescuing them from slavery, overcoming Pharaoh and his armies at the Red Sea, bringing them through the wilderness. As I was with Moses, Joshua, so I will be with you. And now here we are, three and a half thousand years later, and the whole of redemption history, 2,000 years of history of the New Testament church to look back upon. And from this perspective, we look back on those events and we see So much more, don't we, that should encourage us. The Lord who was with his disciples in the boat in the midst of the sea, who with a word made the storm cease, that Lord is with us. 
The Lord who was with Paul at Philippi, who opened Lydia's heart, who shook the prison, who saved the jailer, he is with us. And we need to see and to grasp the glory of that and the reality of that. He's with us. In other words, we don't have to try in some artificial way to shake ourselves up, to raise the temperature, and then say, ah, now God is with us. No, he's with us because he said, where two or three gather together. And because he said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. It's true because of his promise. Sometimes, you see, we can look at the promises of Scripture and we think that the promises of Scripture are promises that jump out and sort of hit us in the face and that stir us up in some kind of special way and then we say, ah, this promise now is mine. The Bible has a totally different perspective on it from that. The Bible says all of the promises of God, all of them, are in him, yes, and amen. And a promise is mine simply because God has made it to me in his word. And that means that if he says, I'm with you, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, it means no enemy can prevail against God's church. For Joshua, it was to overcome the nations. For us, it is go into all the world and make disciples. For us, it means I send you forth as lambs amongst wolves. What, what hope does a lamb have in the face of a wolf pack? People look at the lambs of the church and they look at the packs of wolves that grow and spread everywhere and they say today, well, it's hopeless. It's hopeless. The church age is coming to a, a, a close. We're living in a post-Christian era. The, the wolves are just going to tear up and swallow the few straggling lambs that remain. And the world is going to spread and advance and the sound of the gospel is going to be extinguished in this age. There's no hope for the church. But you see, the church that is faithful to God and the church that is faithful to a gospel ministry, that church is going to survive and we have no right to be discouraged and no right to be terrified in the face of the future, no matter how many wolves might surround us, no matter how ferocious they may appear, because Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And when our Lord says that, he did that with total knowledge of the 20th and the 21st century and all the forces that welled up against the church in our generation. So when he says that it means not only can no enemy prevail against the church, but also that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Now, there are many of the Lord's people today, and they're severely burdened by enormous responsibilities. And perhaps the spiritual lives of many people depend upon them and they're under pressure and they're facing opposition and they meet all kinds of problems in their work. And what can they do? What can they do? See, this searches a man to the depths of his heart. What can I do? And what I have to do is take my doctrine of God's sovereignty, my doctrine of God's omnipotence, and I have to apply that doctrine. And I have to apply it not, not just in the sphere of debate and discussion that sometimes take, take place, but also in the mundane, humdrum, individual life that I have to live as a Christian. And we're to see the glory of it on Monday mornings in the office and at the end of the month when the bank statement comes in and you wonder how you're going to make ends meet. You have to apply that to the problems of your family and the problems of the church and the difficulties and the opposition that you might face. And as I was with Moses, and as I was with Elijah, and as I was with Paul, and as I was with John Calvin, as I was with George Whitfield, so I will be with you, God says. What can we do against the forces that confront the gospel and Christianity today? What can a little Christian do against materialism and Marxism and Islam and existentialism and humanism? What can a little Christian boy do in the face of the world's liberal theologians against 
the galaxy of false prophets that there are in the world today? What can a little Christian do against secular education and the forces of the world's scholarship? What can little Christians do against the gates of hell? Well, they can do nothing except trust and obey. Nothing except I'm hiding in thee, thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. We are to trust him when he says, I will be with you. So when we're in a difficult situation, we can call out from the fearful pit and the miry clay, Lord, deliver me, be my help. Trust him when he says, I am with you. I'm able to keep you from falling. When your children leave home, You entrust them to the Lord. When they want to stand on their own two feet, he is able. He's willing. Doubt no more. So what I'm saying this morning is, away with pessimism, away with all this talk about, well, the church is really up against it these days. We have to face the enemy, face the battle and the labor, face it prepared for toil and sweat and tears, because he said, I'll be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So every commission he gives and every obligation he lays upon us, every obstacle he allows to confront us and rise up before us, every permitted trial, we can deal with them. We can endure them. We can overcome them through him who never leaves us or forsakes us. Through him from whom no created power is able to separate us. So this great commission is given to Joshua. Go into this new world, conquer it for me. And here is this promise, I'm with you always. And then secondly, we see the, the equipment that we're to take on this mission. And that is a book. Verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. Now notice especially what's happening here. The Lord is speaking to Joshua as he spoke to Moses, mouth to mouth. And as he speaks to Joshua directly, as there is this direct revelation of God's mind and God's will to Joshua, God is speaking to him personally, and yet this is what the living God says to him. Joshua, You must become mighty in the Scriptures. You must have a thorough knowledge of the Word of God. You must meditate on it day and night. You can't get by, you can't survive on the occasional times when I come and meet with you. You can't survive by waiting for me to summon you into my presence to give you a word because I've spoken to other men. I spoke to Adam and to Noah and to the patriarchs. I spoke to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I spoke to Moses. Now don't be lazy. Don't think you can ignore what I've said to others. You've got to go and find out what I've said, what truths I gave them, what precepts I laid down, what principles I work upon. I'm not going to repeat myself. I've said this to them. They've recorded what I've said. And you, you now must study and meditate and know what I've said to these men, what promises I gave them, what warnings, what grace I showed to them, the laws I gave them, because it is for your learning that I've spoken to them. It's for your encouragement that you, through the patience and comfort of Scripture, might have hope. Now, we have so much more, don't we? We have far more in the book that God has given to us than Joshua had in the book God gave to him. We have the Psalms and the books of wisdom and the prophets and we've got the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ and God speaks to us and gives us the same exhortation that he gave to his servant Joshua. Don't let this book of mine depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. And that means that at the most elementary level we are to be familiar with the contents of the Bible and we are to know what the Bible says. It's history, it's narrative, the facts of biblical revelation, so that we can talk about it. We can talk about the promises. We can talk about the commands. That's what Christian fellowship is. We can talk about 
his precepts. We're to memorize it so that it's at our fingertips and we can quote it and we've mastered its contents. And there's only one way we can do that, and that is by constantly reviewing what Scripture says and by diligent study and seeking to understand it. And notice what he says to Joshua. He doesn't say, don't let this depart from your mind. He says, don't let it depart from your mouth. In other words, you are to be talking about it. You are to ask questions about it. You are to puzzle out its meaning. You are to seek to comprehend the great message of the Word of God. Why does he say this here? What does that mean? And you are to use it in prayer and intercession and praise and thanksgiving and in everyday speech and witness and defense of the faith. You are to use the Word of God. You know what it'll what it's been like, perhaps, on occasion to be talking with somebody and you're discussing some situation in your life, and then they quote a word of scripture, and a whole new dimension opens up on your circumstances. Because now here is a word from God with authority, and I have to take that word into account and apply it. Or here's a Jehovah's Witness knocking on your door and you're talking with them or maybe even arguing with them and they quote a verse of scripture now you have to deal with that very seriously don't you because now it's not just two people arguing but here is a word is this word being quoted correctly you see i need to know the meaning of scripture and so god says meditate on it day and night think about it Bring this word to bear on your circumstances. In other words, we are to use the truth continually, to use this book of God to discipline our lives, to comfort ourselves, to bring us peace and joy and gentleness, and to make us happy Christians, and to make us earnest Christians. We are to use it to bring our emotions, emotions of discontentment and restlessness, to bring them under the control of, of the healing and sanctifying influence of the word of God. And then he says this, verse 7, Observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left. And then he says at the end of the 8th verse, Observe to do all according to all that is written in it. Be careful to do. Be careful to obey. And so he brings this whole comprehensive revelation of God's word to bear on Joshua. And he says, now be careful to do it. Do you remember how the Lord said to the Sadducees in Mark 12, you do err because you do not know the scriptures. They weren't taking care to know and to do what God's book was saying to them. You know, very often weakness in faith means that we know the teaching, we're perfectly aware and understand what the gospel of Jesus Christ is, but we're not doing anything about it. We don't do it. We don't bring the word of God to bear upon our souls and upon our circumstances. We are not relating the commandments of God to our lives. We're not bringing the comfort of the Psalms to bear on our downcast and disconsolate condition and here God is saying to Joshua meditate on them talk about them think about them and obey them do them and that's the challenge it's a challenge to us intellectually and it's a challenge to us ethically but more than that is it's a challenge to us emotionally you see there are certain emotions that are ruled out for a Christian that are sinful In the Christian. Joshua, do not be terrified. You look at the enemy and you're believing in me, the Lord of hosts, and you are terrified when you look at the enemy? That's sinful. Do not be discouraged. When I'm on your side, when the whole of power divine surrounds you and you are discouraged, when you look at the grasshoppers of the world that surround you Joshua remember how our Lord speaks to the disciples in the upper room he says let not your hearts be troubled and that they must have looked at him with astonishment because he had just said to them that he was leaving them 
And now he's saying, but don't worry about it. Don't be discouraged by that news. But he doesn't just leave it there. He gives them reasons why they ought not to be discouraged. You believe in God. You trust me. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you will be also. And he's saying to them, now, you know the word of God. You know these great truths. Well, apply them. Be careful to live by them. Make sure they calm the tempest that rises in your soul because they were so burdened and they were so troubled by their circumstances. And the answer to their trouble was to put the word of God into practice, to apply the word, the promise to their lives. Or again, you remember how those Hebrew Christians in the early church were becoming depressed during a time of great need and suffering and chastising. And the writer says to them, you have forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you as children, to God's children. And the word that they had forgotten, which God speaks to all his children, whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son he receives. And that word had departed from their mouths, it had departed from their minds, and because that word had gone, they had no comfort when troubles overwhelmed them. And I'm saying then that the answer to your problems this morning lies in the teaching of Scripture. The answer to your problem lies in the preaching of the Bible, week by week. And you must sit under the preaching of God's Word, the most clear and the most faithful and true preaching you can. And yet by itself, that is going to be no help to you unless you're doing what the Word of God says. Some people seem to think that preaching week by week isn't enough, but there has to be special conferences where another man says the same things, or we've got to go to some kind of counsellor who will take months to tell you the same things that you're hearing being preached week by week. James says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, and he compares those who hear but don't do to people who look in the mirror to see their appearance, and they see that they need to wash and to comb their hair and to adjust their clothing, but they don't. They walk away and they parade their carelessness and their untidiness and they parade self-contempt and contempt for others. They look in the mirror, they see something's wrong, but they don't do anything about it. That's such a sad thing. If you saw a woman like that, you'd think, why doesn't she do something about herself? Doesn't she see? Doesn't she understand? Or a man, for that matter, out of respect for himself, out of respect for others. But then that's how we can speak about ourselves if we are hearing the word of God and not doing it. If we don't act when the Bible says to us, be this kind of father, be this kind of mother, be this kind of child to your parents, be this kind of church member, be this kind of Christian in society, live like this, speak like this, don't talk like that, don't behave in that way. And we read these exhortations and we hear these exhortations and if we are not doing anything about it, then we are parading our contempt for the word of God and our contempt for ourselves. We are hearing, but we are not doing anything about it. This is what God is talking to Joshua about. He's saying, do these things. Be careful to do them because this is the way to real prosperity. This is what true prosperity is. You prosper in your life with God and in your relationship with God. That's where real success is. The success of attaining the love of God and attaining true discipleship. Then you will prosper. Then you will be successful, God says to him. And so we see the commission that God gives to Joshua. The promise he gives that he'll be with him as he enters the land. And the equipment he gives him, the word of God and his daily consideration of and meditation on the word. And then very briefly, because our time has gone, Joshua's response in verse 10 and following. Joshua's response to what God says. He acts, he sends officers through the camp, tell the people to get ready. In three days' time, we're going to cross the Jordan and take possession of the land. So he understands what God is saying to him, and he acts. And really, that's what Christian faith is all about. 
You come here, you hear a message, and then you do something. The Word of God is intended to touch and to motivate your conscience and your will so that you think, well, now I must do something about this in my life. And the only proper response is Joshua's response, which was obedience. The longer he delays, the more difficult it's going to be. So Joshua is prompt and he's wise. He was wise. Three days' time, he says. Three days because the people had to prepare themselves. They had to organize their supplies, gather the flocks, pack their tents. Three days for Joshua to prepare for the invasion. For example, we know in the first verse of the next chapter, Joshua sends out two spies to reconnoiter the land. And then two and a half tribes, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, they'd already obtained their inheritance on this side of the Jordan. Moses had already given it to them. That was their home and their rest. But the other tribes, they hadn't entered their rest yet. So, So Joshua asked the help of all the fighting men of these two and a half tribes to help them possess the land before they went to their own on the other side. You see, Joshua doesn't hide, does he, behind a misunderstanding of God's sovereignty. Joshua didn't say, well, if we're to have this land that God has promised us, we'll just send a couple of dozen men in, and the Canaanites will run away. Do you remember the the Spanish conquest of South America when 30 men took over the whole civilization of Peru. That was a very strange event in history. Thirty men and an empire fell before them. Joshua doesn't presume. He's he's not presuming on God acting while he sits back and plucks the grapes and uh, watches the Canaanites run away from him. He doesn't forget the whole biblical emphasis that we have on man's duty, man's freedom, and his responsibility to obey. God calls us to be good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ, to endure hardship for him. He reminds us that our battle is with principalities and with powers and rulers of darkness in this world and the spiritual wickedness of high places, and that we have an enemy within and we have to do battle. Now, God is determined to give the land He's determined to give the victory. God has decreed it. It must happen. It has been predetermined by God, but he has determined to give it to them this way, through their obedience, through their preparation, through their fighting, through their courage and bravery and wisdom and discernment and wise alliances and everything else we find later in the book. So there's a land to be won but it's going to be won by the energy and the devotion of the people of God. And that's the principle that we work under today also. God's sovereign promise is that this world is going to be filled with the knowledge of his glory. God promises that the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And God has told us the means by which that happens, by the faithful witness of his people. God says to Paul at Corinth, don't be afraid, open your mouth and speak. I have many people in this place. And he stays for 18 months teaching and evangelizing and praying. And by those means he found the Lord's people. And so the people respond to Joshua. It's a model response in verse 16 and 17. All that you command us, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. Only the Lord, uh, just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Remember how Paul says to the Thessalonians, he thanks God that when they received the word, they received it not as the words of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. And so then we are to receive this word this morning. Not my words, God's word. And we're to do them. We're to accept them warmly and with concern and joyfully obey God's word. And the last words of the chapter are, only be strong and courageous, which is an echo of verse 7 and 9. They're an echo of God's words to Joshua. And here are the people speaking and responding to Joshua, and they tell him, be strong, be of good courage. 
And that must have been a wonderful encouragement for Joshua that as he accepts this commission that God has laid on him, the people themselves also accept his leadership and endorse him as their leader. We will follow you, but be strong, be courageous. And at times it's good for us to show our spiritual leaders our concern for them, to say to them, in effect, go on, lead us. We're praying for you. Don't be afraid. Be courageous. Well, the Lord bless his word to us this morning.